welcome you all um, online and in person. Um, just a short note that this is the first time we meet at the colloquium in person since 2019 or early 2020. <clears throat> and this is the first ever colloquium to be held in a hybrid format. So if there's any glitches, um, please bear with us, but we are hoping that um, it will all go smooth. Um, we are going to uh, record the, <clears throat> the talk, but the Q&A part will not be recorded, so you don't have to um, worry about that bit, but that goes um, same for the Zoom. Um, for those of us, for those of you who um, joined us online, I will be keeping an eye on the questions um, that you might have and collate them and convey them to um, the speaker at the Q&A. And um, <clears throat> I just wanted to remark that we have a very exciting program in front of us for the year. And uh, this has been the work of, of uh, many people um, uh, the, the Institute Colloquium's um, committee, um, which is Trim Eister, um, Lisa Onaga, Roberto Lali, uh, and Ohad Parnas, um, who's uh, here. And thank you so much for putting this uh, wonderful program together. Also, we're supported by the amazing communication and tech team um, headed by Stephanie Hood and Verena Brown, um, by the offices of Department 1 and 3, Lina Schwab and um, uh, Rana Al Zaid. Um, so thank you um, to all of them and the wonderful library team who have made the virtual bookshelf available for these. And without further ado, I don't want to take um, um, space and time away from the main event. So I'll give back the floor to Jürgen Ren um, to introduce our speaker and uh, we'll start um, this year's colloquium. Welcome. So thank you, thank you very much. I just might add that we use a webinar uh, format, which is a bit less interactive, but you should uh, see uh, the window in your Zoom application for those who are online. And uh, it has some drawbacks, but we hope it, it will run smoothly. Uh, the Institute's Colloquium Series of 2022-23 uh, is dedicated to rethinking science and scientific knowledge in terms of peace and in times of crisis and wars, as we are currently experiencing now in Europe, even in Europe, because wars have been going on in other places all the time, but now also in Europe since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February of this year. The series thus deals with the very topic that is on all our minds, and the question is, what role is there in such a situation, but also more generally, generally speaking, for science diplomacy? And what could it be if it isn't uh, the function that we see appropriately? But now let me come to introduce our speaker, who is a leading authority on these issues, on science and politics in the 20th century, more generally speaking. John Kriege is the Regents and Kanzler Professor Emeritus at the School of History and Sociology at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. His research focuses on the intersection between the history of science and technology and of US foreign policy since the 1940s. He is the author of, and I'm showing the book, I'm proud to show you the book here, Knowledge, Regulation and National Security in post-war America and editor of Knowledge Flows in a Global Age, a transnational approach. And this is the proceedings of a conference that he organized at Caltech following his award in 2020 of the Francis Bacon uh, Prize in the history and philosophy of science and technology. But these are, of course, just his most recent productions. There's a long list of publications by John Kriege uh, he is one of the uh, co-initiators uh, and uh, authors of the history of the CERN, for instance, to, to go back in the past. Uh, and that past uh, is, uh, is important to both of us because we know each other for a long time, uh, actually longer than the Institute was founded. And uh, we had always new, uh, multiple occasions for collaboration. And the last one was just last year when we collaborated on the Anthropocene Marcus workshop, uh, which was held together with the Haus der Kultur und der Welt uh, in Berlin. Today, John will speak about the irreversible entanglement of science politics and regimes of knowledge control. So very much in line with the publications I just mentioned. 
so, John, without further ado, we very much look forward to your presentation. I promised you I give a short introduction, and here it was. The floor is yours. Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for attending this in person and for those many of you online. It's really a great pleasure to share my work with you. I thrive on interaction. I can't survive without it. It's always a good way to clarify my mind and take away my mistakes. So I want to begin this afternoon with using two vignettes to profile tensions in the current science-state relationship that pits scientific internationalism against knowledge regulation by national governments. This is not directly on science diplomacy, but it is of extreme importance for science diplomacy. And I'll come back to the science diplomacy aspect a bit later. That done, I will describe the historical roots of this dispute, injecting it into an historical process that goes back to 1949, if not before, that gains momentum in the 1970s and the 1980s during detente and the Second Cold War with the Soviet Union, and that, is in, that has increased with intensity over the last decade, as the relationships have changed with China from one of constructive engagement to systemic rivalry. My central argument is that since at least 1945, the United States' quest for a predominance of global economic and military power has been based on the pursuit of scientific and technological preeminence or leadership, and that this has involved constructing regimes of knowledge control or control or regulation over the global production and circulation of certain kinds of knowledge in the name of US national security, which is both military security and economic security. And this has happened for reasons both internal to and exogenous to the practice of fundamental research itself. So at the core of my talk is that really science itself has changed in fundamental ways uh, over, the, over the last 20 or 30 years. Now this is causing real, real changes in the way the United States government interacts with its scientific community in universities as well as beyond. So let me just talk a little bit about scientific internationalism and national security. On January the 28th, 2020, Charles Lieber, eminent Harvard professor, material scientist, potential Nobel Prize winner, and a member of all three American national academies, was led into a federal court in Boston in a yellow jumpsuit with handcuffs around his wrists. Lieber was accused by the Department of Justice of lying to the government and of lying to Harvard about his participation in China's Thousand Talents program, a Beijing-sponsored initiative to encourage prestigious researchers from abroad to spend up to five years in China, sharing their knowledge and experience with local faculty and students. Lieber's participation amounted to setting up a mirror lab to his own lab in Boston to train students at the Wuhan University of Technology in improving the performance of electric batteries for, for, for automobiles, a major site of global economic competition. He was released on bail of a million dollars, and despite a spirited defense by his attorney, uh, he, a federal jury found guilty found Lieber guilty on six felony charges, two counts of making false statements and four related tax offenses. His lawyers have challenged this, of course, and the decision, this decision and the case is still pending. So that's the first little story. The second is this. On March the 1st this year, 41 distinguished academics, including six Nobel Prize winners, signed an open letter on Twitter, deploring what they called a tragically misguided government campaign that is discouraging US scientists from collaborating with peers in other countries, particularly China. It's not a great slide because I photographed the thing from Twitter. They insisted that most of Lieber's misdemeanors should have been handled by the university itself, not criminalized by the government. In supporting Lieber, they said, they were standing up for his outstanding scientific record and the fundamental concepts of scholarly collaboration, academic freedom, and scientific advancement. They added weight to their case by arguing that charges brought by the government against a distinguished professor of mechanical engineering at MIT had collapsed for lack of any kind of evidence. The signatories to this letter did not mention in any way the content of Lieber's work. That for them was irrelevant. For them, international scientific collaboration in basic science is an unassailable value and essential to the advancement of American science itself drawing the ire of the 41 academics who openly criticized the charges leveled against Lieber for collaborating with China. The administration sees things obviously quite differently. In fact, to quote one deputy director of the CIA, scientists do not immunize themselves from social responsibility simply because they're engaged in a scientific pursuit. 
particularly, we might add, if that contributes to China's success in producing batteries. Those are my two little vignettes. These very quick introductory observations help me set the scene for my talk today. For more detail on my arguments, there are the two books that uh, Jürgen mentioned just come out this year with the University of California Press, Chicago Press. My aim is to contextualize the actions of the Department of Justice in their treatment of LIBA, situating it in the long history of US government policies to restrain the uninhibited circulation of knowledge across national borders. I will trace this history from the early Cold War up to the period of detente. I will then highlight the conjuncture of major changes in government policy and in the practice of, of advanced university research that brought the two link into head-on collision, firstly with, when the, in collaboration with the Soviet Union and then later with China. My central claim is that these protectionist policies are responses to through three various policies. First, the conviction that national economic and military prowess depends on scientific and technological innovation. Secondly, along with changes in the practice of scientific research itself. And thirdly, oops, what's going on? Thirdly, with the globalization of the research community in a context of political and ideological rivalry, first with the Soviet Union, and then since 2000 with the People's Republic of China. This sounds like an American story, so why should we care anyway? Well, actually it's not. It is about the, re the reaction of one major Western power to the globalization of the research system and its implications for Western democracies of the rise of China as a major scientific and engineering nation. It is also a story with immense relevance to us here in Europe. One of my American engineering colleagues at Georgia Tech who does fundamental research on terahertz imaging techniques very basic kind of work, and who welcomes Chinese students in his lab, recently invited a student from Harbin University to join his group for graduate work. The student's visa was refused by the government. The point of the story is that the lab is in France, in Metz, and the government that refused the visa is the French government. So it's beginning here too, also in Germany. Recently, Thomas Banger, a senior member in the, in the, uh, of planning in the German Federal Foreign Office, Fed Federal Foreign Office said, and I quote, we are deeply concerned about the infiltration, manipulation, and IP theft in some cooperative agreements established by Chinese universities with our universities and research institutes in Germany. This is an American story, but it is also becoming a European story. And I hope that some of the younger people in the room will, will look into this new development in Europe, which is gathering momentum, tracking what the United States is doing and many other countries, Australia, for example, Canada to some extent. Okay, let me start on the regulation part of the story. There's nothing new about governments restricting the transnational circulation of some kinds of knowledge in the Cold War. Classification of certain kinds of nuclear data are obviously the case in point. And indeed our books, my book particularly with, uh, with Mario Daniels is situated via, via of course, Alex Wellerstein's classic book. This is well known, the restriction of classified work. But what is usually ignored by historians of science and technology is that the Truman administration simultaneously extended the system of export controls that had been put in place during the war and that were formalized in the Export Control Act of 1949. This act did not only target commodities, uh, but also technical data, as it was called, that was deemed sensitive from a national security point of view but not so sensitive as to be classified. There are three points to stress. Firstly, that there is in fact a vast category of sensitive unclassified knowledge and data, typically knowledge that has both is dual use, has both civil and military applications, that is too sensitive to be left to circulate freely, but not sensitive enough to be, to be classified. So it's in an intermediate gray zone. Second, that this regulation is legally enshrined in export controls that we usually think of as simply applying to commodities, things you pack in a box, crate up, put a customs form on, and you ship. No, it's it also actually impacts the circulation of what the government calls, what the law calls, technical data, that I'll explain in a moment. And the third thing to stress is that these regulations have spilled over into advanced university research, where their application and implementation has been, and still is, the subject of muscular negotiations between the academic community and the American government. So the whole of the talk focuses on technical data, sensitive, unclassified data 
that is regulated by the American government for certain purposes and to certain countries. What is technical data? Well, its definition has evolved over time, though its core has remained roughly the same as it was when first established in the 1950s. For our limited purposes today, technical data is that. Uh, any professional, scientific, or technical information directly and significantly related to design, production, and utilization in industrial processes. So this is what businesses face, right, most of the time, but also academia. By virtue of this law, you need a license to send abroad any model, design, photograph, photographic file, document, or other article or material containing a plan, specification, or descriptive or technical information related to these aspects of manufacturing. It's very comprehensive, and it's gotten more and more comprehensive. But even more restrictive than this, you could not share this technical data on such industrial processes abroad or in the United States with anyone with the knowledge or intention that the person to whom it is furnished will take such data out of the United States. So if you have a foreign uh, engineer visiting your company and you know that that engineer is going to go back home, sharing that knowledge with him is counted as a deemed export and you need a license to share it with him. So too, at the time, if you teach students certain kinds of processes, shall we say, chemical engineering processes in class, you would, as it was set up at the time, you needed a license to share that information with him because, or, the, or her because it affected production <coughs> processes and manufacturing processes. Well, of course, the academic community was absolutely up in arms about the interference of the government in face-to-face -face teaching in American laboratories and universities. And by the way, this still happens at Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech engineers have to sometimes be careful that they may not, that they, they can't say certain kinds of things in classes where there are Chinese students, say, teaching thermodynamics of jet engines because of this export control system. So the Department of, uh, the Department of Commerce made two concessions. Firstly, it removed export controls on published technical data, obviously, in books, art in books available in the public library or in technical journals which were freely available. Then it also allowed the free circulation of unpublished scientific and technical data if it was for educational purposes, shared at, you know, shared at meetings of conferences, for example, or in the classroom, although that's being challenged now. So academia built a kind of collect, uh, the Department of Commerce left a kind of area around academic teaching where you could share technical data with people from anywhere in the world as long as you respected certain conditions. American firms doing business overseas had some difficulty at first grasping the full extent of the law regulating unpublished knowledge exchanges in face-to-face -face interactions when providing a technical service to a licensee. The situation was clarified in a landmark case in 1962 concerning a New York-based firm, Hydrocarbon Research Incorporated, HRI. The Department of Commerce authorized the company to Percival Keith to build a petroleum cracking plant in Romania if and only if HRI, its associates, and any HRI personnel who might go abroad in connection with it were to use no unpublished US technical data. But what did unpublished US technical data mean for the government as far as this firm was concerned? The CEO of the firm assumed that it meant patented knowledge that the firm would, of course, not share with anyone else anyway, and that the opposing category of published data, or in other words, technical data that could circulate freely, included any information or documents which a competent, experienced engineer thought he could furnish or prepare with his own mind using well-recognized, publicly available principles, texts, technical articles, and patents. The Department of Commerce disagreed. For the government, <coughs> the application of technical data by Western engineers without a license of the United States origin, know-how, and experience constituted an unauthorized use and export of unpublished data. That's an incredible statement. What it meant was, that knowledge and know-how accumulated during a career in the United States and lodged in the heads and hands, tacit knowledge as we call it in science studies, of an experienced individual counted as unpublished data. And you could not share your experience 
with a foreign national from a communist country, at least at the time, uh, without uh, getting a license from the Department of Commerce to do it. It even retained its status, its nationality as U.S. origin knowledge when it traveled around the world. It never lost its origin as U.S. origin. It never lost its nationality as U.S. origin knowledge, no matter what happened to it, no matter how many times it was diluted. And that's why export controls apply extraterritorially. A very important point also today, by the way, the whole pipeline debate uh, when it was still unresolved was all about the extraterritorial application, extraterritorial application of export controls. This is why I'm so fascinated by this work, because how does the government regulate the circulation of tacit knowledge, intangible knowledge, knowingly, knowingly do so? The notion that, and this became more important, in fact, in the law, the notion that the sharing of intangible knowledge or know-how needed to be regulated by the government was propelled to the heart of the export control system in the 1970s during the period of detente. The Department of Defense noted that Soviet trade missions to the United States negotiating with contractors like Boeing or Lockheed, were not actually interested in buying anything, any hardware, any commodity. They wanted technical knowledge, technical data, knowing tacit knowledge and information. They, to, to do something about this, they commissioned a report in, the, in 1976 by a panel of leading businessmen, uh, chaired by Frank Boosie, the CEO of uh, Texas Instruments, that was a semiconductor manufacturer. The Boosie report, slide eight, here, is regarded as one of the most important policy recommendations in the history of American export controls. It insisted that rather than concentrate export controls on things, commodities, as I said, that you wrap in a box and ship, you should concentrate your efforts on mechanisms that transfer design and manufacturing know-how, the detail of how to do things. Why? Because the acquisition of know-how is being give, currently given the highest priority by, by industrially advanced communist countries. The release of know-how, Boosie's report said, is an irreversible decision. Once released, it can neither be taken back nor controlled. The receiver of know-how gains a competence which serves as a basis for many consequent gains. That notion of gaining a competence, of learning, is at the core of this export control regime. For Boosie, the main aim of these controls was to protect American global leadership, meaning to maintain the scientific and technological gap with the Soviet Union. To that end, he insisted that a sharp distinction had to be drawn between acquiring, say, a computer or a semiconductor plant and acquiring the technical data and tacit knowledge needed to, to its design and its manufacturing. Hardware transfers alone did not narrow the technological gap. Transferring the detail of how to do things, actually the detail of how to make things was really at the point. Um, enable recipients to learn, acquire additional competence, um, a set of skills that could be used to improve the efficiency and the performance of the hardware, and indeed to innovate in new directions that threaten to narrow the technological gap with the United States. Academic research was not Boosie's main concern yet but it did become increasingly important as we move into the 1980s. In 1981, the French president, Francois Mitterrand, handed President Ronald Reagan a set of 4,000 KGB documents passed on to him by an agent that detected to Europe, defected to Europe. These so-called farewell papers sent shockwaves through the American intelligence community. As described by the Assistant Secretary of Commerce, they revealed that, and I quote, operating out of embassies consulates, and so-called business delegations, KGB operatives have blanketed the developed capitalist countries with a network that operates like a gigantic vacuum cleaner, sucking up formulas, patents, blueprints, and know-how with frightening precision. Congress deplored the lack of reciprocity in, uni in U.S. Soviet exchange programs. Um, uh, U.S. students in the Soviet Union study topics like the administration of... Uh, of the Russian Empire under Catherine the Great. Soviet visitors to the United States studied topics like the preparation of microtunnel diodes in gallium arsenide by annealing or molecular beam epitaxy. These targeted research projects were complemented by the training of an increasing number of foreign national graduate students in crucially important techniques and skills. Laura Baker from Los Alamos explained to Congress, a very, very edgy Congress, what he called the apprenticing experience in a typical engineering program at MIT or Stanford. 
After a year at MIT or Stanford, Baker said, a student starting with a blank notebook will hold a microprocessor as a chip in his hand. He'll have used computer-aided design to design the microprocessor, computer-aided layout to lay out the processor on silicon, manufactured the chip either in the lab or in collaboration with the manufacturer, tested the circuit, packaged the circuit, mounted the microprocessor on a printed circuit board, and made the resulting computer work, all under the watchful supervision of experts to make sure the student understood his activities. And then Baker really hit the button. Seen from this angle, he said, U.S. Soviet exchange programs are a particular coup on the part of the Soviets. The best technology transfer organization in the world is the United States university system. The government was quick to react. It used export controls at once to try to stop visitors from Russia and China attending meetings of professional engineering societies. It intervened in university invitations to Soviet scholars by cutting back their agendas as much as possible and limiting it only to published work and results and not anything that might be otherwise. And government officials, and this is where it's important for me, have publicly warned the research community that a new balance had to be struck between scientific freedom and national security in favor of tighter controls. The Secretary of Commerce put it this way, the Soviets are exploiting the soft underbelly of American openness, including the desire of academia to jealously preserve its prerogatives as a community of scholars unencumbered by government regulation. The time has come to ask what price we must pay if we are unable to protect secrets. Of course, he meant what price the academic community must pay if they were unable to protect secrets as he saw it. The deputy director of the CIA, Bobby Inman, was even more explicit in a speech he gave to the AAAS, AAAS, in January 1982. There was a growing tension, he said, between scientists' desire for unrestrained research and publication on the one hand, and the federal government's need to protect certain information from adversaries who may want to use this information against the nation. And then he made the quote that I made earlier. It was hollow, he said, to suggest that national security should not have an impact on scientific freedom. Scientists do not immunize themselves from social responsibility simply because they're engaged in a scientific pursuit. And then implicitly referring to the farewell papers which had not yet been declassified, he said the intelligence community had evidence of a hemorrhage of the country's technology to the Soviet military system. The research community's antipathy to regulation, he said, was about to be wiped away by a tidal wave of public outrage when the breadth and degree of technology transfer to the Soviets was revealed. And the public asked, how the hell did this happen? And that was, of course, an, a call for the government to step in heavily to regulate knowledge circulation inside academia as well as without. The growing tensions between the research community and the government were resolved by the findings of a panel set up by the National Academies and the Department of Defense and chaired by Dale Corson, a prestigious physicist from Cornell University. The Corson panel, the Corson panel found that, in fact, very little sensitive, unclassified knowledge was leaking from universities to the Soviet bloc. They were dead against using export controls to, to manage university research. Instead, they insisted that if research was a threat to national security, it should just be classified, period. On the other hand, and this is crucial, they also identified a gray zone of research where classification was not appropriate and where government control could still probably be invoked. This involved research in a field that had four characteristics. It was developing rapidly. It was dual use, so it has civil and military applications because you want to capitalize on the commercial possibilities if it's civil, but you want to protect the military side of it. It did not give the Soviets any important, it would give the Soviets military benefit if it was not controlled, and in which the time from basic research to application was short. There's much more to be said about this causal panel and its report. There's a whole chapter on it in the book. It was a concession to Inman, though, that it admitted that the Soviets were determined to acquire sensitive, unclassified knowledge and know-how from US companies and what they said was new Western technologies emerging from universities and research centers. This was all the more worrisome because the development of equipment and processes, the development of equipment and processes for the manufacture of various items was often only an extension of the equipment and processes developed to conduct the basic research, as we saw in Baker's claims to Congress. And this opened the gate for government regulation of specific kinds of basic research. As, uh, yeah, yeah. as one export control officer put it to me and other people, 
If universities behave like a business, we'll treat them like a business. This is the cardinal point. For here the course in report, report is gesturing to the transformation in the conduct of academic research made possible by the Bayerdahl Act and the Stephen Weindler Act of the early 1980s. Together, these acts authorized university researchers whose work was supported by federal grants to take out patents on their results and to commercialize their products, setting up businesses of their own or in which they were major shareholders. This new system of commercialization was in its infancy when the Corson, Corson and his panel met. It is now widespread, as Morosky reminds us repeatedly. It's hard to get a lot of hard data on this, but according to one of Obama's panels on Advisory Council on Science and Technology Policy, today, that's 2012, American research universities are closer to the marketplace than they have ever been. With, an issue, with, the, with, a, with a focus on translating and transferring research into discoveries to industry. From 1991 to 2010, the number of patent applications filed by universities rose to about 4,500, issued in five, 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 FY 2010, to the 183 centers that they surveyed. Licensing income from these patents has soared to $2.4 billion, and many, many startups have been triggered by them. That graph there gives you, th that's an idea of the program that the government supports. It's called the STTR program, and I don't want to go into this in detail, but what you notice, this is funded by R&D funding, phase one explores feasibility, technical merit, and commerciability, and it requires university business collaboration, and at least 30% of the money must be spent on R&D in the university. In phase two, if you get far enough towards commercialization, you get money to take the next step towards commercialization from the federal government. And these are some of the fields that are most active in there. Biological sciences and medical sciences are particularly prominent, but also chemistry, physics, uh, and computer sciences. In practice, this means that basic research is ever more closely entangled with development, testing, and marketing. It also means that foreign nationals are trained to acquire knowledge and know-how that is often very market-oriented and whose transfer abroad can raise serious questions about the dangers poses to US national economic and military security. The claim in the 1980s that universities were hemorrhaging sensitive and classified knowledge to the Soviet bloc was soon admitted by Inman himself to be baseless. Since then, the transformation in the structure of research, enthusiastically embraced by the American research community itself, of whom Charles Lieber is a prime example, the explosion in the number of doctorate students in, in STEM fields from China who graduate annually from US research universities, and the rise of China as a major economic and military power has unleashed the same concerns and the same arguments voiced in the 1980s about how to balance the freedom of research with the demands of American national security, and it is happening in Europe too. It is these concerns that have manifested themselves in the high-profile conflict between the US Department of Justice and the research community over the fate of Charles Lieber that I'll briefly turn to now in the last third of this paper. So let me speak about America and China a bit. Again, this is very brief. There's a lot of this material is in the book. As of 2018, there was a sharp uptick in congressional hearings, reports by congressional committees, and by Washington think tanks, as well as in the news, discussing the challenges posed by US scientific and technological collaboration in academia with China. The tenor of the debate was set in a joint hearing of two congressional committees in April 2018. There its title is, Scholars or Spies, Foreign Plots Targeting America's Research and Development. Clearly, the answer to the question is yes, there are, there are spies and they are targeting American R&D, especially those from China. Uh, this was made clear by Christopher Wray, the, president, the head of the FBI at the time, in a number of major interventions. By the way, Christopher Wray was President Trump's appointment to the FBI. And for those of you who think the world has changed, President Biden reappointed Christopher Wray as the president of as the chair of the FBI the day after he was nominated. He took office as president of the United States. There's massive continuity between Trump and Biden on this issue in the United States. Christopher Wray, in, in, to, speaking to the Senate Intelligence Committee, was asked by Senator Marco Rubio, a real hawk on this question, to comment on the counterintelligence risk posed to US national security 
from Chinese students, particularly those in advanced programs in the sciences and mathematics. Ray replied that in his view, the Chinese threat is not just a whole of government threat, but a whole of society threat on their end. And I think it's going to take a whole of society response to it. Everyone was in on it, he said, including the 130,000 Chinese graduate students and researchers who work and study in the US every year. Put plainly, in a famous statement, China seems determined to steal its way up the economic ladder at our expense. Note this is not directly about a military threat, it's about an economic threat. And there's the concept of economic security is used to identify that threat and justify government intervention in the market to contain it. And he deplored the level of naivete of part of the academic sector about this. They, that means the Chinese uh, academics and researchers, are exploiting the very open research and development environment that we have, which we all revere, but they're taking advantage of it, targeting our information and ideas, our innovation, our research and development, our technology. To make matters worse, if this research is funded by the federal government, and much of it is, of course, DARPA, the NIH, NSF, then, of course, American tax dollars are paying foreign graduate students to learn great new things which they can go ex exploit once back in China. Ray's charges resonate strongly with the Reagan administration's narrative in the 1990s, as, in 1980s as regards academia. There's the same reference to the soft underbelly and easily exploitable openness in American academic research by a foreign power. The same claims that academics are hopelessly naive about the problem that this poses and the threat it poses to national security, and the same threats that the government will have to have no option but to intervene heavily and place tighter constraints on the international production and circulation of knowledge, then with the USSR, now with China. There's one big difference, of course, that China today is not the Soviet Union 40 years ago. I don't have time here to de detail the history of the transformation of China into one of the most dynamic economic powers on the globe. That's done somewhat in, this, in both of these two books of mine. Here, let me just remind you of the explosion of its scientific and technological capacity over the last 20 years, before teasing out to conclude some of the implications for US-China academic exchange and coming back quickly to Libra and science diplomacy. What is the scale and scope of Chinese innovation system today? The National Science Board's recent reports on science and technology indicators provide one with a time-sensitive picture of the stunning rise to prominence of the Chinese innovation system. So I'll just show you quick graphs very quickly. They're very obvious. That is the increase in R&D funding by China compared to other countries over that block of years. Can you see? Sorry, it's not that clear. Never, ne needless to say, the top red line is American increase in percentage of R&D the bottom purple line climbing up and just touching the United States is the exponential rise in China's investment in R&D as percentage of GDP since 2000. That's the number of people, graduate students in China who get science and engineering degrees in China over the same period. And again, that red line, that S curve is the increase in Chinese graduate students in China getting science and engineering PhDs. The green line is the American line. So there's as many in China now as there are in America. This gives you the data on how many graduate students from China get PhDs in STEM fields in the United States. Just look at the third, second line, uh, which uh, under 2008, you see China science and engineering graduates. Systematically over those 10 years, it's been four to 5,000. The total of those 10 years is about 44,000 PhDs in science and engineering from American universities. And finally, Chinese international collaboration the top line shows the number of papers, uh, peer-reviewed papers published by Chinese scholars or scholars based in China. Red means without a foreign collaborator, green means with a foreign collaborator. And you can see that it's more and more active with foreign countries. The United States, as you can see, is the second line. It is also increasingly collaborating with other countries. Its preferred partner is China in terms of numbers of papers published with somebody from China. So there's a huge interaction between these two fields. And of course, this whole collaboration is facilitated by what historian of science Zhuo Yuang calls a spirit of cultural nationalism, uh, expressed through Chinese scholars in America's identification with the developmental aspirations of their country of origin. Notwithstanding this collaboration, as of 2013, no less than 84% of Chinese students who receive PhD degrees in America in science and engineering 
stayed in the United States for at least five years. China's official talent programs were devised precisely to compensate for this brain drain of very gifted people to foreign countries. Talent programs sought to take advantage of the intellectual assets of overseas Chinese and of foreign scholars to inject new ideas and expertise into the indigenous innovation system. It is the participation by Charles Lieber at Harvard and many other US-based researchers who are funded by the Thousand Talents program that is really worrying the United States government today, and it's becoming very muscular about it. The TTP, or Thousand Talents program, was established in 2008. In the first 10 years of its existence, it recruited about 7,000 well-educated and highly skilled researchers to China. A close reading of its official website shows that it involved far more, though, than what we normally understand of in terms of scientific exchange. China is not just interested in smart people. As the program itself said, but its website is down, by the way, it's been taken down now, when gifted recruits go to China, they are playing a positive role in the scientific innovation, technological breakthrough, discipline construction, talent training, and high-tech industry development as an important force in the construction of this innovative country. These government-funded talent programs are embedded in an overall agenda that seeks to transform China into a global economic power by the mid-21st century. Made in China 2025, launched in 2015, has singled out 10 key sectors in which the PRC seeks to secure a dominant share of the global market. They are central to the so-called fourth industrial revolution, integrating big data, cloud computing, the internet of things, and other emerging technologies into global manufacturing systems. Some of their foci, like artificial intelligence, robotics, autonomous vehicles, gene editing, will be generic, so that many applications or end-use technologies can be built upon them. They are part of a science and technology-driven innovation strategy that sees investment in innovation as contributing to nation building. China regards its talent programs as a legitimate instrument for economic and military modernization. The US, protecting for the US, protecting national security, for the FBI, sadly, insist that they are platforms to advance China's economic dominance over us, using economic espionage and theft of intellectual property. For the US, protecting national security, including the kind of work that Lieber does, involves defining policies to control transnational flows of knowledge to China from a university research system that is increasingly integrated into the commercialization of new products and processes that contribute massively to American prosperity. For the Chinese government of Xi Jinping, access to foreign science and technology is a national imperative. As the Central Committee of the Communist Party put it, and, and, and the State Council put it recently, and those of you who are China experts will understand the resonance in this statement, the important reason for the bat backwardness and beatings of China in modern times is that it has lost contact with previous scientific and technological revolutions. Innovation drive is the destiny of the country, and through it, we will realize the Chinese dream of the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And that last statement sends shivers of fear down the backs of the American national security system. So China is confrontationally seeking, securing American science and technology for these long-term strategic goals, to take a dominant role in the world market. You can understand why America is so on edge and perhaps why Europe should also be concerned. So we cannot, we go, going, let's go back to those people who wrote that thing on Twitter who didn't even ask any questions about what kind of work Lieber was doing, who really can't understand the charges brought against Lieber without situating them in this long historical trajectory that engages America's exercise of its global power and its responses to threats uh, from authoritarian communist regimes and the changing roles of science and technology in sustaining global economic and military advantage. Lieber was fully emerged in this transformation. His CV states that he has published over 340 papers in peer-reviewed journals and is a principal inventor on more than 35 patents. Lee has also been active in commercializing nanotechnology. He's founded two nanotechnology companies, Nanosys Inc. in 2001 and a nanosense, nanotech sensor company, Vista Therapeutics, in 2007. With this background, Lieber's contract, which is available on the web because the Department of Justice made it available when they charged him, he was contracted to make strategic, visionary, and creative research proposals that would meet China's national strategic development requirements. 
He would establish a Wuhan University of Technology, Harvard, joint nano key laboratory. He would be declaring international cooperation projects, cultivating young teachers and PhD students, organizing international conferences, applying for patents, and publishing articles in the name of WUT. So he's applying for patents in the name of the Chinese institution, apparently. A five-year academic cooperative agreement specifically defined the scope of his work as being advanced R&D of nanowire-based lithium-ion batteries with high performance for electric vehicles. And the South China Morning Post spoke of this as promising to revolutionize energy consumption, manufacturing and green technologies, potentially touching many strategic sectors in Beijing's Made in China 2025 blueprint to upgrade its economy, as well as touching many strategic sectors in the West that are concerned about getting nanowire technologies which can improve lithium batteries. Until very recently, there were no legal obstacles to Americans-based researchers participating in Thousand Talents. Now it is strictly controlled. Export controls on sharing technical data could not be invoked in Lieber's case, since he, the research combined basic and applied research that was openly published. This loophole is under challenge now and will probably soon be closed. Universities themselves, like MIT, are working closely with the government to mitigate the risk of sensitive unclassified knowledge sharing by China with China by formally vetting your grant proposal even before you apply for the money to make sure that there's no risk of you signing a contract with a Chinese partner that can actually pass on sensitive knowledge to them. MIT has also refused any financial support for research from Huawei. The Department of Justice charged Lieber for breaches of research integrity and tax evasion. Today, a far wider range of regulations on academic scientific exchanges with China are being implemented or considered. For example, in visa policy, just one very obvious one. Here's my last point then about science diplomacy. I hope the implications of my argument for the practice of science diplomacy are pretty clear. For the scientific community, committed to scientific internationalism and prone to ignore the content of the knowledge that is traveling across national borders, transnational scientific collaboration can play a major role in interstate diplomatic relationships. And all the more so if one agrees with this Japanese researcher in China who said, just recently quoted in Le Monde, scientific interna activity is international and knows no borders, the total opposite of national ideas. Every scientific achievement is the common property of humanity. It's a very noble idea. But of course, for the national governments, on the other hand, uh, the, deeply concerned about the loss of sensitive and classified knowledge to rival powers, the position is wholly untenable, not to say irresponsible. Science diplomacy must accommodate itself to knowledge regulation. For, as Bobby Inman said, it is hollow to suggest that national security should not have an impact on scientific freedom. Scientists do not immunize themselves from social responsibility simply because they're engaged in a scientific pursuit. So what should it be? Should we treat knowledge as the property of whole humanity? Or should we understand that it has a very strong today national content, essentially important for national security and national economic success, and that therefore we need to regulate it to some extent, and science diplomacy has to navigate between these two extremes, knowledge regulation and the free circulation of knowledge. Thank you. <laughs>